January 28, 1938, the Darmstadt Frankfurt Autobahn. A silver streamlined bullet screams past at over 269 miles per hour, its 16-cylinder supercharged engine howling like nothing else on earth. Moments later, the car becomes a twisted wreck. The driver, dead, the engine, about to be outlawed forever. This is the story of how politics, tragedy, and a single regulation destroyed one of the most powerful racing engines ever built, Ferdinand Porsche's masterpiece that the racing world tried desperately to forget. A deal with the devil. The year was 1933, and the automotive world stood at a crossroads. Adolf Hitler had just seized power in Germany in January, and like every dictator before and since, he understood something crucial. International sporting success could assert Germany's status on the world stage better than any propaganda. And what better tool than motorsport, representing both the heroism of drivers and technological prowess? At the same time Hitler arrived on the political scene, the Association International des Automobile Clubs Reconnais hatched what they thought was a brilliant plan. They concocted a new Grand Prix formula for introduction in 1934, setting a maximum vehicle weight of 750 kilograms. The rulemakers naively assumed this upper limit would rule out large-capacity, high-power machines. They couldn't have been more wrong. The German Ministry of Transport set aside 500,000 Reichsmarks to fund racing development. Mercedes, already a motorsport powerhouse, promptly claimed all of it every last mark. But they hadn't counted on the persistence of a smaller company or the cunning of men who knew how to work the system. Auto Union had been formed just a year earlier in 1932. Four struggling German manufacturers, Horch, Audi, DKW, and Wanderer, joined forces united by the four-ring badge that would later become legendary. The new entity was initially non-committal toward racing. After all, they were fighting for survival in a depressed economy. But Baron Klaus von Ortsen, Auto Union's chairman, had ambitions, and he had connections. Enter Hans Stuck, a factory driver whom Hitler personally admired. Together with von Ortsen, they made representations directly to the Fuhrer himself. Their pitch was simple but compelling. For the glory of Germany, wouldn't it be better for two companies to develop racing cars rather than one? Competition breeds excellence. Hitler, ever the strategist, agreed. The 500,000 Reichsmarks would be shared between Mercedes and Auto Union. Mercedes was furious. They'd already developed their car. Now they'd have to split the funding with upstarts who didn't even have a design yet. What Mercedes didn't know was that Auto Union already had something extraordinary waiting in the wings. The Austrian genius and his mad design. In Stuttgart, a small company was working on something that would change racing forever. Its leader was Ferdinand Porsche, the former technical director of Steyr. His outfit had been working on road car designs for the Wanderer Marque before the merger. But Porsche's real passion lay elsewhere. Porsche's design agency was a tight-knit team of visionaries. Engine specialist Joseph Kales handled the power plant. Porsche's right-hand man, Carl Rabe, oversaw chassis development. Even Porsche's son, Ferdinand Ferry, contributed. And crucially, Adolf Rosenberger, a well-heeled amateur racer, provided financial backing from his personal fortune. Together, they penned the outlines of a 750-kilogram car that marked a radical departure from everything that came before. It would be mid-rear-engined, with independent suspension all around. And powering it would be a V16 engine producing in the region of 300 horsepower. The question wasn't whether the design was revolutionary. The question was who would pay to build it. When Auto Union came calling with Hitler's money, Porsche had his answer. The company bought Hochleistung's motor GmbH and the P. Wagen project for 75,000 Reichsmarks, relocating everything to Chemnitz. By the end of 1933, Auto Union was testing its debut Grand Prix machine in the Eiffel Mountains, and the automotive world was about to witness something unprecedented. The engine that shouldn't exist. The rear mid-engine rear-wheel drive layout was unusual at the time. From front to rear, the layout comprised radiator, driver, fuel tank, and engine. This wasn't just different. It was heretical. Every competitive racing car of the era put the engine up front. 
Porsche's layout put massive weight behind the driver, challenging every conventional wisdom about vehicle dynamics. But why a V16? Porsche's reasoning had more to do with packaging than with the high RPM potential afforded by the use of so many cylinders. The choice of a 45-degree V angle, coupled with small bore sizes, allowed for a very narrow and relatively short engine. It would fit within the regulation-mandated width of the cockpit, helping to keep frontal area low. Here's what made this engine extraordinary. It was never intended to run at high RPM. Porsche was after low-down grunt. Peak power was delivered at just 4,500 RPM. Due to the low RPM, only two valves per cylinder were required, and significantly, the use of heavy and complex dual overhead cam heads could be avoided. Instead, all 32 valves were operated by a single centrally mounted camshaft. The inlet valves were actuated via finger followers. The exhausts used push rods. This layout was made possible thanks to the narrow V angle, and it saved crucial weight. The first iteration of the supercharged engine ran 1.66 bar of boost absolute and could muster 295 horsepower. Everything about the engine was built to be lightweight. The cast silicon aluminum block featured wet liners. The main bearings were supported by substantial webs incorporated into the block casting, eliminating the need for a structural sump. The engine had hemispherical cylinder heads for optimal combustion, and crucially, it was designed with the potential to enlarge the capacity at a later date. Porsche knew this was just the beginning. When the P-Wagon made its public appearance at Avus in March 1934, setting a string of speed records, the automotive press went wild. Autocar reported the engine as having reputedly the world's most tremendous exhaust note. Sixteen cylinders breathing through a supercharger created a sound that had never been heard before. It was terrifying and magnificent in equal measure. The original engines displaced 4,360 cubic centimeters, but the performance potential was obvious. The engine's flexibility was so remarkable that Bernd Rosemeyer later drove an auto union around the Nürburgring in a single gear to prove it. One gear around the most demanding circuit in the world. That's torque. Racing success and the beast unleashed. But racing success wasn't immediate. The centrally mounted engine's momentum changed the car's turning angle as weight shifted on the chassis, causing severe oversteer. All auto unions had independent suspension, with parallel trailing arms and torsion bars at the front. Porsche tried to counter the tendency to oversteer by using a then-advanced swing axle suspension on the early cars. It wasn't enough. Auto Union used a clockwork mechanism and a paper disc to record data such as engine revs while testing. This allowed engineers to study collected data later. They found that accelerating out of corners caused the inside rear wheel to spin furiously. The solution came at the end of the 1935 season, a Porsche innovation called the Limited Slip Differential, manufactured by ZF. It helped, but the cars remained treacherous. Hans Stuck secured Auto Union's first win at the Nürburgring in July 1934, but only after the leading Mercedes of Rudolf Caracciola suffered an engine failure. By the end of the season, Auto Union had secured three Grand Prix victories to Mercedes's four. Respectable, but not dominant. Then Porsche unleashed the beast. Over the next two seasons, the V16 underwent dramatic modifications and capacity increases. In 1935, the engine was enlarged to 5 liters displacement, producing 370 horsepower. But that was just the warm-up. For 1936, Porsche threw all caution to the wind and increased the V16's displacement to just over 6 liters. Power climbed to a staggering 520 horsepower for the Type C. One source claims it eventually reached 620 horsepower and the Type C reached 258 miles per hour in the hands of Rosemeyer and his teammates. This was the largest capacity engine to compete during 1936 and 1937, engineered to be the biggest possible within the 750 kilogram weight limit. The power increase required significant internal changes. The most notable was a switch from plain bearings to roller bearings for the main journals. This required the crank to be built in sections rather than a single piece, using hearth joints between each section. 
interlocking toothed profiles were secured by bolts passing through each crank pin. It was complex, but it handled the tremendous forces. But there was a price to pay. The Widowmaker Despite Porsche's best efforts with weight distribution, 60% of the weight still remained on the rear wheels. The high power-to-weight ratio, uneven weight distribution, and Porsche swing axle suspension system made the Type C oversteer viciously. Only a couple of drivers were able to take the Type C to its full potential. Most couldn't predict fun when the rear would break loose. The forward driving position made it worse, giving drivers almost no warning before the car snapped into a spin. Only Rosemeyer and, to a lesser extent, Stuck could master the Type C. When Rosemeyer got it right, he was unstoppable. The Type C won six out of twelve races entered in 1936. The young driver secured five of those six victories and won the 1936 European Championship. Between 1935 and 1937, Auto Unions won 25 races. The silver cars had become legendary, but Mercedes wasn't sitting idle. By 1937, they'd upped their game, refining the disappointing W25 into the fearsome W125. The Via 16 was by then some 100 horsepower down on the 600 plus horsepower, supercharged straight eight Mercedes. With Porsche now engaged in Adolf Hitler's Volkswagen scheme, there were few changes made to the Type C for the 1937 season. Rosemeyer and Stuck struggled against the mighty Mercedes-Benz. The 750-kilogram formula had created exactly what regulators feared. Engineering developments had resulted in engines producing tremendous horsepower in lightweight vehicles, leading to high speeds and excessive accidents. The formula ended in 1937. Something had to change. The ban that killed a legend. The introduction of a three-liter formula for 1938 was devised as another means to check the ever-increasing power and speed of the cars. In 1938, the Grand Prix regulations set a limit of three liters on supercharged engines. Read that again? Three liters for a supercharged engine. This meant the end of the road for the V16 as a Grand Prix engine. You couldn't shrink a 6-liter V16 down to 3 liters and expect it to be competitive. The architecture simply didn't work at that displacement. For 1938, the rules were changed heavily, and the successful Type C was rendered obsolete overnight. Porsche changed paymasters to Mercedes. He was replaced at Auto Union by Professor Eberon von Eberhorst, who developed the Type D with a 3-liter V12 for 1938 and 1939. The V16 wasn't technically banned, it simply couldn't exist within the new regulations. It was a ban by mathematical impossibility, but the Type C soldiered on in hill climbs and speed record attempts, where capacity limits didn't apply. The V16 would make one final tragic appearance on the world stage. The final run, January the 28th, 1938, the Darmstadt Frankfurt Autobahn. Auto Union and Mercedes lined up for a speed record attempt, with both teams sharing the cost of shutting the roads under a gentleman's agreement. The stage was set for one last battle between the old rivals. Caracciola, in the Mercedes Streamliner, set an initial speed of 268.9 miles per hour, shattering the previous record held by Rosemeyer. The gauntlet had been thrown. On his warm-up run in the Auto Union, Rosemeyer hit over 267 miles per hour. Close, but not enough. Conditions had turned gusty and the Type-C streamliner appeared unstable. Rosemeyer should have stopped. The wind was picking up. The car was moving around. But Burnt Rosemeyer literally did not know fear. On the return leg of his second run, having already clocked over 269 miles per hour on the outward trip, disaster struck. It's thought the wind caught Rosemeyer's car, pushing it onto the Grass Central Reservation. He lost control and crashed heavily. At 269 miles per hour, there was no walking away. The young star didn't stand a chance. Caracciola later commented, Somehow I never thought a long life was on the cards for him. The crash almost led to Auto Union withdrawing from racing entirely. The company had lost its best driver. The Via 16 had claimed its final victim, and the engine that could have dominated for years had already been regulated out of existence by rules written just weeks before Rosemeyer's death. The Legacy Erased 
What happened to the V-16 after 1938 reads like a horror story. Today, only very few examples of the V-16 auto unions remain, with most of them fallen victim to racing incidents and later wartime aggression. During the latter part of World War II, an estimated 18 auto union team cars were hidden in a colliery outside Zwickau, where the auto union race shop was based. In 1945, the invading Russian army discovered the cars. They were retained as war possessions and shipped back to the Soviet Union, distributed to scientific institutes and motor manufacturers for research. It's believed that most were probably reduced to scrap. Of all the Type Cs constructed, only one is believed to have survived with its original engine intact. The sole remaining Type C was left to a German museum by Auto Union after Rosemeyer's death. Damaged by bombing during the war, its body still shows those marks today. Think about what was lost. An engine that produced 620 horsepower from 6 liters in 1936. An engine that proved mid-engined layouts could work decades before Cooper made the mainstream in the late 1950s. An engine that dominated an entire racing series, winning 25 races in three years. All of it wiped away by a regulation change and a war that destroyed most of the physical evidence. The 1938 three-liter formula didn't just end an era. It erased one of the greatest engineering achievements in motorsport history. Ferdinand Porsche's V16 was too successful, too powerful, too dangerous for the racing establishment. They couldn't ban it outright, so they changed the rules to make it impossible. The engine simply couldn't exist within the new regulations. It was a ban by mathematics, a political execution dressed as safety policy. Think about what the V16 represented. A single centrally mounted camshaft operating 32 valves. Hearth joints connecting sectioned crankshafts to handle forces no other engine could withstand. A 45-degree V angle so narrow the entire power plant fit within the cockpit width. An engine that delivered peak torque at just 4,500 revolutions per minute, yet could propel a car to 269 miles per hour. An engine so flexible, burned Rosemeyer, drove it around the Nürburgring in a single gear. 620 horsepower in 1936. Let that sink in. By comparison, naturally aspirated Formula One engines in the early 2000s produced around 900 horsepower from 3 liters. Porsche's team achieved two-thirds of that output from 6 liters nearly 90 years ago, using technology that would look primitive in a modern machine shop. No computer modeling, no wind tunnels, just slide rules, intuition, and engineering genius. Between 1934 and 1937, the V16-powered auto unions won 25 Grand Prix races. They dominated hill climbs. They shattered speed records. They made Mercedes, with all their resources and heritage, look vulnerable. And for that success, they were legislated into extinction. Seventy million people died in the war that followed, and with them, went most evidence of what Porsche and Auto Union achieved. Eighteen cars hidden in a colliery, seized by Soviet troops, likely reduced to scrap. Only one Type C survives with its original engine, still bearing scars from wartime bombing. The Auto Union C-Type V16 wasn't just banned from racing. It was nearly erased from history itself. Some truths were meant to stay buried, but not this one.